Black Talk with James Canning. The podcast with the inside scoop on journalists from San Diego and across the nation. If you're a communications pro, have a nose for news, or you're just nosy, this is the podcast for you. Now here's your host, James Canning. Hey everyone, welcome back to Flack Talk. I'm really, really excited for today's show. I'm going to tell you why. We're going bi-national. That's right. We got a bi-national reporter here with us today. Our very first, our very first. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about what that really means, but I'm really excited to have Tony Alvarez from Televisa, Tijuana here in uh, San Diego studio, which is really a virtual studio, talking to us Flack Talk talkers. Hey, Tony, how you doing, man? Thanks for being here. Hey, James. Well, thanks for having me. This is this is a great opportunity to talk about exactly that, uh, the binational life, if you will. And I got to say, please listen to Flag Talk. It, it's a great podcast. Podcast. I'm sorry. Um, I'm a fan. I got to say I'm a fan, James. Oh, hey, don't don't apologize. You heard it here first. Tony is a fan, uh, but we're a fan of his, and that's why he's here. As you know, the show is all about learning about different journalists from San Diego, across the nation, and internationally. We're doing it all. We're really trying to do it all. Uh, this is a passion for me, and uh, I'm really glad that you've come here today. So here, so here's the thing I want to kick it off for folks. So like, if you've listened to Flag Talk, folks, you know that we've had a couple people who've been in other countries, India, Germany. They've been reporters there. They've kind of settled in. We're there for several years. But, but as I mentioned earlier, Tony's our first binational reporter. And so for Tony, will you please share with our listeners, what does that mean when you're a binational reporter? Uh, well, it, in essence, you live in one place and you cross the border to cover the news in the other place. Uh, in this case, for me, I live in Tijuana, born and raised in Tijuana. Um, and right now, we're working for Televisa Tijuana, which is uh, the local TV station of probably the most important and popular Latin America uh, corporation for television and as of late for social media as well. I am assigned to cover San Diego news for Southern California in, in certain cases. That means that sometimes I even travel a little bit up north, the five, uh, Orange County, sometimes L.A., but obviously like 99.9% of the time I'm in San Diego. That's what I'm assigned to. And and it's, it's, it's great. I love it. And I'm pretty sure that if you ask any binational reporter if they, they love it, they do. But at the same time, it's just one of those things that you need to learn how to go through uh, this idea that maybe people have that, oh, the, it's so tough to cross the border, right? Or the struggle or, or the wait time or CVPs or how do you, you know, manage to get stories on the other side? And, and it's pretty cool because probably we get up a little earlier than the normal reporter that covers San Diego because we need to cross the border. Yeah. But at the same time, it, it's so fun. I mean, it, it's it's having that San Diego County, Southern California perspective, and you you broadcast for Tijuana, but at the same time, I don't know the, the percentage exactly, but it's such a high percentage of people that do the exact same thing that I do and many of us do, you know to to just work over there or go to school in San Diego. And I say over there because I'm in Tijuana right now, but you know, right, right, school right. or work in San Diego. And it's such a daily normal thing. And, you know, it's funny because I get that a lot from, you know, some colleagues from the San Diego area and other colleagues that travel from, I don't know, maybe uh, Mexico City or other parts of, of the country. And, and you know, the, the main question is, how do you do it? Uh, and it's, honestly, it's pretty easy. I, I guess I say that because I've been doing this my whole life pretty much. And I've been crossing the border since I was like, what, like two years old? <laughs> uh, but but I mean, for, for working purposes since 2010, and it's a blast. And I love it, and it's it's great. And once you get the handle of things, uh, obviously for my background, that I'm pretty sure we're going to talk about that a little bit further. I'm not going to spoil <laughs> anything. But uh, it's fun. It's fun, James. I mean, I love the binational life because that's what I call it. 
and uh, you know being from the border uh, as we say over here it, it's a saying so it, it's a thing it's like it's a lifestyle yeah yeah so let me ask you i'm gonna ask you two questions that weren't what uh that kind of popped out of my head when you were uh talking there so the first one is tell our flag talk listeners why do folks in tijuana want to know why is it important for folks in tijuana to understand what's happening here in san diego well it, there's a, an old saying um geez that goes wow it dates back many 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 years um and the whole country that says that when the u.s coughs mexico you know you know catches a, a cold hmm. so so that effect from an economy standpoint from you know politics and everything that U.S. you know does, it affects Mexico. And I'm I'm just you know from a general perspective. Right, right, right. right. But but you know even though many people have come from other parts of Mexico to pretty much live in in Tijuana, and I guess because they're hoping to cross the border one day, and for some reason they can, and they end up living here in, in Baja California, and you know mostly in Tijuana. Um, they want to know what's going on in San Diego, either because they one day aspire to get there or because, like in my case and many other families, they have family members over there. Mm -hmm. And either they can or cannot cross the border to see them. But it's funny because we and I say we because I'm talking about me, my family and many people I know, friends, uh, we're always information of what's going on in san diego because we well look I'll, I'll speak again from a general perspective we we cross the border frequently i do it every day for work um but before i got into you know this job when i was a little kid i used to cross the border i'm not gonna kid here uh, i'm not gonna lie this is uh true once a week like every sunday was like a family trip you know either to yeah. go to uh the the non-existent horton plaza or <laughs> i used to love to go to seaport village uh you know there was a big park there still is a big park in the chile vista library and i mean these are just certain places that i'm pretty sure that other families have other traditions or you know stuff that they used to do and well, i guess people my age i'm 34 now that when they were little kids, you know, their parents take them. And and it's, again, this binational lifestyle that I know it might sound like something we say every time, but it's so true. And there's so many people that, again, cr cross the border when they were little kids to go to school. And then for some reason, they can be either residents or citizens. And now they live in San Diego and other family members live over here. And it's... I mean, you've seen the border lines from yeah. Tijuana to San Diego. Yep. Have you seen the border lines from San Diego to Tijuana on a Saturday morning? Because there's so many people that live there but have family members over here. And, you know, they get the weekend off, so they come and spend time over here. So it, everyone's always looking out for news from San Diego. And also, I got to say this, um, in uh, the station I work, in the company I work uh, for now in Televisa, uh, since we have a special news broadcast with only San Diego and California and certain national U.S. national news um, that's focused on the people that are Hispanic or Latin that live in San Diego. So it. um, it's it, it's a big deal and everyone's always aware of what's going on in San Diego. And it, it's funny because I don't want to be like the popular guy here but oh you're popular uh, you know, man you are the journalist that's popular <laughs> this is about you today <laughs> you, you. Uh, there are times that uh, I'm having a day off and probably one would think why would you cross the border on your day off if your work you know means they need to cross the border <laughs> uh, but I like it over I mean I've like I love stuff. so um, what I'm getting at is that I meet people you know on the streets or in I don't know in in some stores or at, at a restaurant and they come up to me and say hey you're the guy from the news right and i'm like yes i'm the guy from the news oh great job thank you thank you for giving us you know updating oh thank you for watching us so you know it's one of those things that you realize the impact you have on people not only in Tijuana, but 
also in San Diego and the Hispanic people and the Latin people. So right, which, which is it, it's really meaningful. So, so Tony, let, let me let me. I'm gonna I'm gonna get more into, a little bit more into what you're doing on the day to day here. But I want to ask this one question: Like, um, can you tell me a little bit about tell our listeners a little bit about like you know briefly your background? But then also, like, what inspired you to be a journalist? Like, was there something there growing up in Tijuana that made you want to do that? Or did you see someone on television? Like, what what, what, what inspired you? I'm a sports freak. I'm a sports guy. I've always loved sports. I've covered sports since I can remember. I have loved sports since I was a little kid. Uh My mom bought me a small uh, recording device. It has a small mic. And, you know, one of those cassettes, like the old school cassettes? Yeah, I know what you're talking Um, about, yeah. So I used to watch the games in English. Thank you, Barney and KPBS, because those are the ones that really taught me English, to be honest. Hmm. And and I always watch games and programs in English. My grandmother uh, used to watch many programs with me as well. And uh, uh, she used to work in in the U.S. Okay. Uh, And... uh, uh, I remember watching the games and kind of repeating what the you know play-by-play guy was saying and what the pre-game and post-game show uh, people were saying. Yeah. So I started recording myself, and then I started recording myself in Spanish as well and other sports. But I, I, must, I mean, I love I mean, it's it's really the sport that I don't like, and I have many on on my list, but I won't get to that either yet. Yeah. So so that's what kind of inspired me to eventually go into to what we call is the uh, main university in the state, uh, UABC, uh, the Autonomous Baja California University. Uh, obviously, I study communications. Yeah. And uh, one thing led to another, and I, I, I got a job as a correspondent for another you know big national corporation called Milenio. I was a sports correspondent there. And I've always covered sports. I mean, I've been, thankfully, I've been blessed with, with the opportunity of having, you know, worked for many local and national stations as correspondent. But this is my first time here in Televisa working for a big company, for the company in Latin America, not only in Mexico, but covering other stuff that's not sports. Uh, I started a little more than a year ago it was in uh, December, December, yeah, it was December first in two thousand twenty-one. Okay. And I, this is going to sound bad, but this is the truth. At the time, I was unemployed. So when they reached out to me, I have many friends there, uh, but my boss, I knew her, but but she wasn't like a close friend at the time. Right. And she said, "You know what? I know you and your background. I know what's going on with you, but I also know you know San Diego." And we need a reporter for San Diego. Are you up for it? And I'm like, all right. I I thought about it a lot. And I want to give a quick shout out here to Scott Yofi. He was in media relations for the San Diego Chargers. I remember talking to him yeah. about, you know, before making my decision. And he said, you know what, dude? First of all, you know, try to, you know, go out of your comfort zone. That's probably the main thing. And also, sadly... Even though we have many sports teams in San Diego and and also in Tijuana, a few, uh, sadly, all of them do not attract as much attention as probably they should. So I don't know if you could actually make a decent living out of that. So instead of thinking of covering sports only and on the side other jobs, other jobs or other things, why don't you focus mainly on this big deal opportunity and you can also do sports on the side and it'll be fine because um there there are more days than there are not sports than what they are you know in the region right that is true no that's great advice advice. that's great advice and and also i kind of look up to ali wagner from kusi she was great because i know she started covering sports as well and now she does everything so uh, I talked to her as well at the time, and uh, she has become a very good friend from from the media and a colleague, and, and Scott, uh, who also very grateful. And many, I mean, I could just go on and on of people that I'm very grateful uh, with. But but I guess on on that main uh, situation I was in of taking the job that I currently have, uh, they were key, and also another friend, um, 
uh, Pedro Gutierrez, who, who works for the Spanish radio station of Padres. He, he's also been great with that. And, and, you know, many advices along the same line of, you know what, dude, I mean, this is a big deal job. It's not any job. So take that, make the best of it, and other things will come up. And to be honest, th thankfully, thank God, uh, other things have, have showed up as well. So that's, no, that's, that's, that's that, kind that, of a short version. No, no, no. Look, that's a wonderful story. I think it's an inspiring story. You know, I think you know, we've talked to journalists on this show who have, have gone through those ups and downs of, you know, you're a journalist one day and then you're not. And then you got to go figure it out, right? I mean, I've been in that situation. I was a PR guy, thought I'd be in a job for 20 years, and then all of a sudden I'm not, you know? And so I, I think that this for, you know, our, our niche here, right, is PR people, journalists, you know, kind of opinion leaders. It's important for folks to see that, uh, you know, you're a pretty face on TV, Tony. You know, they read your byline online, but uh, we all go through the same challenges, you know? <laughs> So definitely, I think I, I appreciate you sharing that and being vulnerable like that, and you know, kind of sharing your story because it, it's not the it's not a straight path ever. Um, someone once called it a uh, kind of like a jungle gym, and you're moving between rings trying to figure out you know where you go next and what you do, and uh, you've navigated it really well, man. No, yes, and I mean, I, I was I guess very comfortable. I uh, I was working for a radio station locally. We. We were broadcasting the the Cholos, the soccer team from Tijuana, the Cholos games in Spanish and in English. I was in English broadcast. Some issues with uh, money there, so we stopped broadcasting in English. And then I was moved to the Spanish broadcast. And then the pandemic hit, and well, I mean, it affected a lot of people, including us. So I right. I got cut off, and then I was jobless for like two months. And then I got a media media relations job for the local sports institute institute but that was for only three months because you know a new administration was coming in so i kind of knew the, the deadline for that um and then again i was jobless for for two months and i since i've started working i've never been jobless until right. that point so it, w it was frustrating i i, I gotta understand uh, that a lot of people have been through even worse but i guess being so used to working uh at that point not not being employed i was like uh oh what wh where do i go now and so yeah i guess that that job opportunity I guess it was a great thing that I yeah. did. Right? No, it's fantastic, man. It's fantastic. I think it's an inspiring story. And folks out there, I think the key is resilience, you know, be enterprising. And frankly, there's no opportunity that you should, you know, look down at because you never know what, what it's going to, what doors it's going to open up. And I think that's really important uh, for people in our industries. Um, yeah, totally you know, agree. Tony, let's talk a little bit about, let's get into the, the kind of the, the the nuts and bolts are maybe the best and the worst of being a binational reporter you know are there you know what's one of the best things and what's one of the most challenging things when it comes to being a binational reporter ah oh, wow that's a that's a great question you know one of the there are many best things but i guess for me just going out with with the people and and reporting what it is the new sport them but you know at the same time and we're going to talk about this before james um many of, all of the governments and the people that work in office and our offices um they're people too so sometimes uh it's it's kind of nice to report what they're going through to either you try to get a a, a law uh you know pass or, or an ordinance or, or trying to really do what the people you know the residents want them to do so I guess trying to, to tell their story and and when, it, when, I, when I say they I mean you know everyone not, not only the people in charge of you know ruling right um, and just going out with the communities and you know it's it's obviously important for me you know as a Mexican resident um, to, to help you know Latin people, Hispanic people, Mexicans, uh, to 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 have their voice heard, you know, at, at a certain point. But at the same time, all of the people, you know, minorities, minorities as well. Uh, I think just just going out there and reaching out and talking to them, and also letting people know certain things that they may not know. Some some certain again laws or or things that they don't know because well you know this better than i do there the book is so thick there are so many pages in the rule book yeah. that people sometimes 
don't have time to know, oh, well, I'm allowed to do this. Or if I apply for this, I can have some help for, you know, insurance or, or I don't know, many things. And and just letting people know the, the different programs that are out there for them, for assistance, for help, for, you know, there are so many issues in, in the community. And uh, and I'm going to speak only about San Diego because that's what I'm trying to cover, uh, you know, that, that people don't know about and they, they, could cal- they could get a lot of help on that. So I guess yeah. that's my favorite part. I'm not going to lie, James. Going to San Diego, I mean, that's America's finest city, right? <laughs> so uh, why would I say no to that, right? That, that That's just great. I mean, and again, it's, it's one of those things uh, where when I cross the border and I go to certain places to cover certain, you know, events or go interview people or get a story, some way, somehow, it takes me back when I was a little kid. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, you know, I was like, oh, I was, you know, Belmont Park. Ah, oh, my mom took me there when I was like seven, and oh, grandma there, and oh, my my or oh, all that. And yeah, that's always cool because you feel like you're at home every time. Yeah, that maybe I have my home here, and then I go to my other home, which is Stadio. So uh, that's that's pretty cool. Um, the most challenging, ooh, you know what, I, uh, I guess it's the border time way to cross and. Even though I have the Sentry card, which is like the fast pass at Disney, if you, I mean, pretty sure people know, but either way, um, there are days where it's just long and slow, and you're, you know, you have like a an event to get to, and it's going to start at a certain time, and even though you get up earlier and you get to the board limb, it's 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 a pain. So I would say that's the only like big challenge. But at the same time, it's not every day. And once you, you know, know certain days that, you know, it might be slower because, I don't know, it's uh, it's a holiday. And, you know, it's, a lot of people's going to want to come back um, or, or something like that. You, you kind of understand the way the border, as it is, works. Uh, but I guess that would be the only challenge. I mean, everything else, I'm not going to say it's easy. But it's so fun, and I love doing it. That you know, you say that if you're you have fun doing your job, you really don't have to work any day. Of the right, day, so. right. No, that's uh, you know, and for folks who are listening that don't know, I mean, you know, it, it's a the border is an issue that uh, leaders here are always trying to deal with in terms of the the timing and things like that. And, and, and obviously, as you've expressed here, it's a it's a variable that you need to account for as you're doing your coverage or covering events or trying to get back and forth and fortunately i'm assuming because of technology you know you benefit a little bit maybe you can shoot your package and send it back and but if you gotta do that live shot and you're supposed to be on the other side Mm -hmm. uh that's a variable and i'm sure you and your team are always accounting for that and that you know that's that's probably different than you know the the reporter at a station here who's got a deadline too uh but they got to go 20 minutes and they don't have the variable, maybe it, maybe a traffic accident or something like that. But you know, not a border wait that does take a long time, even though uh, you know you have all the proper uh, you know tools to pass, you know, the sentry and so forth. So I appreciate you sharing that. I think I think that that's something that uh, we haven't heard a lot about yet on our show, and uh, I think that's important for folks to really understand that there's variable, especially being a binational reporter, is a lot of things that kind of deal with and and, and and go through and, and i love the fact that you know your stories of the best things i, I think that sometimes the nostalgia of a of, of a family experience that can kind of pop its head up in your uh career is always a very nice kind of uh shining point in a day so thank you for sharing that so tony have there ever been any real wild stories uh that you've had to report on you know maybe something that's happened to you while you're reporting or something that was unbelievable or new at the time uh, you know, James. Um, you know, one of those things that, uh, you know, it it's it's new to to a lot of people, uh, whether if it's technology or a new program or or something that's like a big deal and it's and it's new and nobody knows about it and it's amazing and wow and then all of a sudden when it's become a thing and you know it's it's common it's not that surprising anymore. Um, and I remember one of my first stories uh, that, I, that I did for Televisa uh, when I when I started working for Televisa Tijuana um, was of those robots 
that UCSD had that they could, you know, figure out, identify on on water certain, you know, particles that would let you know that they had COVID in the water somehow. And if, you know, though that water from, I don't know, sewage or whatnot would, would go to a certain area, a certain amount of people in that area would, you know, get COVID and it would show up a few days later. That was obviously big, you know, in San Diego at first, but that was pretty common and, and they use it a lot in many areas you know, of, of the county. Uh, but, you know, for us over here, which is also one of the beauties and, and you know, things that make you kind of scratch your head as well from, you know, by national lifestyles or, 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 or ideas or whatnot, is that, that being so close over here, that was completely new. I mean, it was one of those things that was like, wait, what? A robot that identifies COVID particles in water? I mean, how does that work? So I remember when I proposed that story to my superiors, uh, they were like, what? What's that? So I kind of pitched it and explained, and then I went over there to UCSD, and they were kind enough to literally explain me step by step how it works. Yeah. And, well, that means, you know, they have to stick their hand in, you know, uh, certain places. Wait, 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 uh, wait, 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 what does that mean, Tony? Certain places, what does that mean? Come on now, uh, tell our well, listeners. Uh, <laughs> well, they get like a sample of, you know, all the water that comes from, you know, restrooms and, you know, other areas. All of, all of the sewers and and all that part. All the of, stuff that's of, in the sewer, right? Yeah, folks, and, we know and, it's you know, in sewers, stuff. right? Do we know it's in sewers? And, I mean, I don't gotta say the word. I I don't really like saying the word, but I think we know what we're talking about, right? Number twos, uh, maybe some number, number twos. Two. Yes, that's that's it. The, oh. the normally brown number two thing. Yes. Oh man. Uh, uh, and, and I mean, those are samples, but. It's funny because they have those row, and I don't know if people listening have. I'm pretty sure they've heard of it, but I don't know if they know how they work. Uh, it's like a, like one of those Star Wars droids, and they're <laughs> in strategical parts of campus. And again, uh, uh, they, they were used in, in other parts of the county that, that, kind of, you can say that US UCSD, excuse me, uh, analyzed all that. Mm -hmm. for the county at some point or for certain areas of the county and certain companies but they were like far man i mean hats off to ucsd because they did an amazing job you know all that department that just they're amazing and they from those like r2d2 (laughs) robots uh (laughs) they those robots you know capture a sample if you will of those particles from that water that has number twos and <laughs> they were analyzed and they would say oh god i mean this has covid particles that comes from a human being so from that area if a person took a sample from i don't know like a classroom i would say or a dorm room uh that means that there's a highly 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 likely situation that many of the people from that specific area on campus would get COVID, you know, uh, in a few days it would show up and it did. So there was, it was a nice way of kind of starting to, you know, isolate people before COVID, you know, tested positive on them. Right. And it, it was, it was a big deal. It, I, I really do believe it helped the, the, the whole community and, and the county. Yeah. And, but you know, that was like a big deal over here. Yeah. Uh, which is very interesting because, you know, a borderline is just a line, right? Well, no, there are so many things, obviously, that the U.S. and San Diego is, you know, so advanced on technology. And over here, when I pitched the idea, it was like a big deal. And I remember when I did the story, they were amazed. And, and you know, my boss was amazed and other uh, fellow reporters were amazed because how does a robot identify COVID and how it could help? Right. And, and we didn't have any. And I don't think we ever did, you know, in, in the pandemic and all that. So that was, but kind of like the the comparison of what UCSD, one of the most important universities of the county, 
and that department and what they do and how they help the people of San Diego just by doing that. And the comparison of, wow, our most important university over here has like no clue of stuff like that or, or, or doesn't have the technology. I'm pretty sure there are a lot of smart people yeah. over here, but probably there are no resources and all that are, are not the same. And that was pretty impactful because when it aired, we started getting, you know, a lot of messages of, wow, how they do it. And, and again, and you kind of asked me that earlier, there were people, San Diego residents, Hispanics, that didn't know about this. And hmm. by watching our newscasts, they found out. Yeah. So that was so that important was because it impacted people. And obviously at a time that we were scared, you know, about everything. You know, yeah. About, you know, just hanging around with people and in, in, in a a close place or even outdoors and you know wearing masks and and you know anti-bacterial gels and, and all that stuff so yeah so, no that, that was pretty cool that was pretty cool that was like, like the the reach it had because yeah. of what it was yeah well you know it, look i think i think it's really important for folks to understand like you know i'm a communicator tony's a journalist but uh, the key in any communication, whether you're working at UC San Diego Health or you're working at the county or you're working for a sports team, is you want the information to um, be understood. You want the information to go far and wide. And, and I think that's a great example um, of why it's so important to have a diversity of news, of different folks, of, of, of types of outlets that you invite and show up to events and and so forth because the reality is that we're not one homogenous kind of people anywhere and folks need you know information in ways that are that they get news and so i i appreciate that you took interest in that and shared that i mean i remember that was when when that when that came across my desk at you know working at the county and we were talking about this because we partnered with them and there's some funding i believe that we had at the county level for that project um, you know, that was unique to me even. And so then when you take it back and then folks can, you know, who are, uh, Spanish speaking or Latin American, you know, Latin or Hispanic can, can talk, you know, know that that's happening because they watch Televisa. That's so important. That is so important. And I think as PR people, uh, we have a responsibility to remember that, uh, you know, it's not just, you know, your five stations, you know, there are, there are binational stations, there are, there are smaller publications with you know that cater to the black community the api community you know the latin american community you know asian community so i I think that that's a really important thing tony and i really appreciate the fact that you know you took that story back you helped a lot of people by doing that you really did and i think that that's you know that's one of the things uh you know we got a few more questions here before we get to our breaking news round but i want to dive into it and maybe do get a little bit because i think it's a good segue into this question i had you know, um, you know, you cover a lot of San Diego news. You take it back, as you kind of shared with that story. You know, you talk to the Televisa audience, and then there's folks here in San Diego who watch Televisa, and they and they take that. But, you know, what is – and you've kind of talked to us a little bit about the process you have to go through to take that information and put it back but uh, uh, and, and share it with your audience. But can you tell us, you know, <laughs> you any, like use this as your PSA, like – how could PR people be more helpful to Spanish language stations like Televisa and others who are trying to report on things uh, and connect with an audience that maybe they don't normally connect with uh, as PR people? Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, you've been very helpful whenever I need help from you guys. <laughs> we try, in, yes. In your, in your area. So, yeah. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, but, but I guess... Uh, you know, from just from a situation of, of crossing the border, it's it's sad for us because I, I know I speak for everyone that needs to cross the border to to work, especially in, in, in the media and, and news to be late. It's it's really frustrating. And again, it's it's one of the, I have to go back to the border crossing. And, you know, sometimes even you can get ahead of schedule but then you're stuck on the five at 8 a.m right so right it, it, it's it's bad enough traffic so what i'm getting at is that i would probably only ask for if there's a 
time or, or or a day that we could be late if there's a way and i know scheduling is is a situation with with, with people because they need other stuff to do right i mean they need to do other stuff they they need to you know attend other you know meetings or go to point a to point b in the county which is huge is huge um i guess only from my end would be that that if if there's a way to save a story if we can't make it to an event yeah certain availability at least through the telephone to to get the story done that that would be probably it and, and you know one of those things uh that kind of you know it has a tie to to what i just said is that and and no i'm not throwing shade to my colleagues in san diego but normally the reporters from the many stations in, in san diego they do one package you know one big important story in the day right and for me and uh, we 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 are two reporters that cross to san diego now uh, that started like like two months ago but for me it was like a year and like five months of only me being the only crew the cameraman and myself crossing the border and doing stories uh i do two packages yeah sometimes even three so hmm. and 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 it's one of those things like you mentioned it before that we had to cross the border do one story head real quick to the second story wherever that is and then we have to come back i guess quote as soon as possible because of the wait time you know to cross back because of all the people that you know get out of work and live in tijuana and you know if if you go to tijuana around 2 30 3 o'clock 4 you're you're toasted you're not going to make it back in time to the station even though you can you know send stuff you know the internet or right news or, or whatnot so i guess that uh, in the interest of <laughs> reporting and saving stories just certain availability when needed and again i i don't know if i'm being a little too much uh you know asking on that because i don't think I you are i don't think you are you know like look we're in a business where you know pr you know communications folks like whoever we work for you know they they want to hold a press conference they want coverage you have to be flexible you know like just because you say oh it's this window to this window yeah ideally that's when it works but you got to be flexible I, I you know and one thing that i frankly i didn't ex- you didn't say and i don't know maybe i'm poking a bear here on this but like and i learned this very early on in my career and frankly i've probably been guilty of not being able to provide this at times i think i know i have but like early on in my career there's a young guy young reporter when i was in detroit uh jorge avian who has now gone on to be a great pr guy he was great in detroit for a very long time and now he's working in pr uh and he worked for the univision station in detroit and he used to give me shit all the time when I worked for the city because we did not have uh, a proper uh, Spanish language um, spokesperson. And then eventually we got one. Um, that's really important too, right? I mean, if, if we're going to invite Televisa or other stations to come, like we to make it easier, to make it more uh, understandable for the for the your 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 viewers like we should try to really have a spanish language person now you guys it seems like you you get around it if you have to but that also be helpful too right oh, oh definitely yes i mean uh, you kind of hit it right on top there because um again I, as sometimes i interview people and you know what this happened like two days ago i was at an event i don't want to burn anyone and they were really nice and everything but this person spoke spanish but it felt comfortable in English, and I'm like, okay. I mean, I Tony Alvarez don't have a problem with an English interview, but like you just said, for the audience, it might be better for them, you know, from an understanding point, from some empathy or whatnot, um, to you know, you know, to listen to that person in Spanish if if available, right? So. Right. So I guess that that will be also a thing that I would add to the list. And you know what? Now that we're on a list, apparently, as I just said. <laughs> One, two. Um, okay, what's your number three? What's your number three? <laughs> number three. And, but probably, um, again, I think I'm, I'm, I'm asking for too much. And I understand because uh, over here in Tijuana, there are different ways of getting the story. And 
I don't say there, there's like a the proper way over here. Uh, I do believe the way that PR guys like yourself or any other institution does events or handles interviews in San Diego or, or the U.S. Uh, is better because over here sometimes you just kind of call and and just ju just insist and you probably will get something. And over here, the people have a schedule and I understand that. But there are times with certain corporations, I'm not gonna name names. Yeah, please don't, uh, please it's don't. not the county though, it's not the county. <laughs> uh, but it's frustrating for many of us uh, Spanish speaking outlets that we ask for a interview and it could be like a two minute interview. Sometimes it's a reporter and and I'm pretty sure that everyone listening would kind of you know understand this. Sometimes as a reporter, you understand that you're not gonna get too much from the people you need you know to interview. So if they could give you on record on camera, you know, a statement of whatever position they're in, that's amazing for I mean that's great. Okay, like okay, I have the bite. I have that statement on video on camera. Mm -hmm. But sometimes when we ask for that, certain institutions send us the statement via email. The written statement. And the written statement. And yeah. Exactly. And that really doesn't help a lot on this side, at least. So I got I you. Guess that, that's, no, that's good. That's so so let, I'm going to recap that list here for folks. So number one, when you're working with any media, frankly, but particularly Spanish uh, speaking stations or Spanish language stations. One, be a little flexible on your time. If you want the coverage, you got to give a little flexibility on that time because there is a longer wait to get there or, you know, longer time to, you know, cross the border. Two, if you got somebody that can speak the language, make them available. And then three, it's always better to have someone on camera versus handing over a written statement. Would you say... Yeah, that's oh, a recap, yeah, that, right? Yeah. That that's it. All right. That's it. Um, that's great. Know, this, no, I I'll, think I'll we just, go ahead. I'm sorry, Tony. <laughs> no, no, yeah. I mean, I just wanna, I just wanna. I, again, I won't say, I won't say any names or any. But uh, there is this PR person at a certain institution that she understands that exactly, and we've come to a point. Uh, I mean, she's she's great. Also, uh, we come to a point where she says, you know what? I'm not available right now, but I know you need this on video. So I'll record myself with my phone and my tripod and my mic. And I'll, I'll send you like a one minute video with this and that. And, and you have no idea James, how helpful that has been for us when for some reason we can get to a place or, you know, some breaking news and we need statement from that institution. Uh, that's been really helpful. That's I mean, awesome. I know that not everyone can do that, but but, and, and and they don't have to do what I say, but that that has been really helpful for the people, you know, not for us, for the people. That's yeah, no, that's that's good advice. That's good advice. All right, Tony. So let's do this. We talked we talked a little bit about your sports career uh, before we hit our breaking news run. I want I want to jump jump into something. I want to know what's your favorite sports team. You talked about like you love all kinds of sports, but what's your favorite sport? Your favorite team, and you got a favorite player in that sport. Oh wow, uh, geez! I don't know if I'm gonna put some people to cry here because of the names I'm gonna say, uh, or, or I don't know if it's gonna be only about pity. But <laughs> obviously, the the no longer existing San Diego Chargers. Yeah. Um, that that pain. I know people listening might say, you know what, dude, get over it, and and I think it's like when you lose someone uh, that you really never get over it but you'll learn to live with that right <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm not gonna lie here I'll, I'll, i still watch him i still pay tickets to go up there and, and see him but i will also be really honest i it doesn't feel the same yeah and it, it does not i am interested yes i watch him but uh, or maybe because i kind of matured in a way you know i grew up but i remember back in the day and you know football it's something about football right james i mean football it's it's just for a period of time in the year it's only once a week when it you know it's, it's a season and it's so passionate so i mean i love football and yeah. and i remember when when things didn't go our way 
uh, I got really frustrated. I mean, like I was mad, and and, and nowadays I get over it, you know, pretty pretty quick. But, yeah. But I guess for football, it's it's uh, it's still the charge, but it's not the same. I'll be honest. Yeah. Um, for baseball, it's it's my Padres, like good old uh, Ted Liner used to say. Um, and and again, it's one of those things that. Uh, those teams are the reason I love the sport. Yeah, uh, I I grew up watching them. So, and you know, it's safe to say th- they weren't very good. I mean, it, it the Chargers went to the to Super Bowl '94, and, and I thought that was like a, a yearly thing for us. And God, it was not. So until you know Tomlinson and, and Rivers and all those people, <laughs> games, blah blah. blah. Uh, and then for the Padres, well, I mean, they they won the division. Amazingly, in '96, I remember that, and I remember buying the Union Tribune and watching the standings, you know, on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And then when they went to the World Series in '98, and I also thought that was going to be like every other year thing. And well, we know that's not the case. We have a decent team now, but struggling right now. That's another story. But I mean, those are my teams for those sports. I, I'm Mexican, so I'm crazy about soccer. Obviously, yeah. obviously. Uh, well, no, uh, hey, we shouldn't assume. We shouldn't assume. But I appreciate you clarifying that. <laughs> Uh, what, what my people think is that I am a Cholos fan, and I am not. Oh, wow. Um, oh. Yeah, when I grew up, the Cholos didn't exist. So one of my favorite players was Jorge Campos, you know, that goalkeeper with all the, the colorful attire. <laughs> and he was probably the reason that I started liking uh, Pumas, which I still love. Um, and I would say that those are my – those are three of my top sports, uh, which I'm crazy in love. Uh, but I'm also crazy in love with tennis and basketball. Okay. And, tennis. That's and a surprising I mean, one. That's a, you don't hear that often. So I appreciate you mind expounding on that just a little bit. Uh, yeah. I mean, tennis, uh, when I was a little kid, I remember watching, oh, geez, I, I, I want to get, well, of course, well, well, I mean, Pete Sampras was like what growing up was my idol, but, but he was, you know, on on the latter part of, of his career, and I was a huge fan of him, and I was a huge fan of Andre Agassi. And uh, growing up, I remember watching Wimbledon with my uncle. My uncle was also a sports freak. Uh, and when I was, you know, growing up, there, there are certain traditions that you have with your family. Mm-hmm. And what are those traditions? You know, that that you just have with him was you know wimbledon and, and getting up early because you, you know they're, they're in england so you gotta get up early to watch the, the matches and they kind of you know stuck with me a lot so i from that point on i was very interested in tennis and i remember when roger Federer beat andre agassi at the u.s open and that was his final match andre agassi and that kind of hurt because I was a huge fan of Agassi. And, yeah. And then from that point on, I started following Roger Federer, and then he became my favorite, you know, tennis player since ever. And and I I, I played tennis, you know, with some friends, you know, at certain courts, but not like on a you know a more professional level or anything. But I I'm very passionate. I used to get up like at two a.m. To watch the Australian Open back in the day. Now I really can't afford to do that, James, because I gotta work. Yeah. So I, <laughs> I gotta be fresh in the morning. Yeah. But uh, I still kind of, kind of, you know, stay up late or, or get up early to, to watch a few matches. But I'm, I'm crazy, crazy about tennis, and you know, it's one of those things that I kind of related to to times of the year. Like for me, uh, again, maybe more so when I was a little kid, but. You know, now as an adult, uh, I hope that one day if I can have, I have kids, I, I really want to have kids and kind of know what I want to share those things that my family shared with me, you know, with them at one point that, you know, it, it when when February hit, you know, spring training was coming up, you know, so it was March spring training. So it was baseball season and, you know, basketball was towards the 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 end of the regular season and somehow uh, after the all star game and then. April was baseball season and then basketball ended and then that meant that Roland Garros and tennis was coming up and then when Wimbledon hit it was so close for preseason for the NFL and then when the NFL started it meant that baseball was going into playoffs soon 
and then when baseball ended, you know, football weather was coming in, <laughs> and then soccer, you know, all, all every every week was was a soccer week. So I got caught up in all those events to kind of have my own calendar, and I remember that I went by that as a way of living when I was looking like, okay, what must one month? Well, I'm sorry for that. Uh, what month is it? You know, I don't know what event is going on. And I'll let you know. <laughs> so, so that that was that was it for me. And obviously, growing up, you know, for basketball, Michael Jordan. Yeah. But I'm a huge okay. Fan okay, here it is. Fan. Go, Jordan or LeBron? Jordan or LeBron? Which one? Who's the go? Uh, uh, that, that, that's I love LeBron, and he might end up with all the stats in the world. But I mean, Michael Jordan, right? Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, you know, I, know. I look, look, I, you know, I grew up a Piston fan and, uh, okay. we hated Jordan. No, okay. I see where this is going. Now. But, but we knew he was hell of a good player. We knew it and it was, it, we hated it. And so, <laughs> you know, I don't know. I mean, LeBron, he's just a different kind of player and he's in a different era. You know, I, mm, Jordan has a killer instinct and I think that that's, the differentiator whereas i feel like lebron's a little bit more like magic in that he's just kind of more likable he's kind of you know he's a really team oriented kind of player i you know kobe matched the jordan killer instinct you know and and lebron he's great i mean i give him his due i i don't know man it's hard for me it's hard for me to figure that out yeah, I mean, again, stats on life, but also the the way that that he plays in certain situations, because that's what makes you know them different from the rest. But but I mean, I just can't go against against MJ. And again, I'm, I'm a Lakers fan. It was weird growing up because um, I have some family members that live in LA and they have lived lived in LA for pretty much ever. Um, thank God I'm not a Dodger fan, but <laughs> uh, they're, they're Lakers fans, and and and. When I was a little kid, it, you know, it was the Bulls, you know, yeah. the tree beat. I, I was very on the second uh, tree beat. So I was a huge Michael Jordan fan, and I obviously followed the Bulls. But for some reason, I always followed the Lakers. So when Jordan retired, well, well he retired the second time. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, followed more. And it was fun because that's when Kobe came in. Yeah. So... And, you know, Kobe's like a copy of, of MJ in, in its own way. So it, it, it was great because, obviously, I follow the Lakers, and I'm a huge Laker fan as well, and I respect all players. But I guess if you – you didn't ask, but I will tell you. Okay. Top three. <laughs> well, I mean, it has to be MJ and Kobe top two. Yeah. I probably put LeBron three. Uh, yeah. And I love Shaq and all other players. You know, they're – geez, I mean, I could just go on and on. And, and you know, kind of to, to – to complete what you just said about different eras, uh, I heard the saying, and I think it was my uncle who said it many years ago to me, and, and he said, it's pretty unfair to compare great players because most of them didn't play in the same era. So, right. you know, and, and I know that people take care of their bodies now more. Um, I was watching one day one NFL film, NFL films doc. Jeez, I'll just go on and on like this. I'll, I'll, I'll make it quick. Uh, Jerome Bettis, <laughs> his final year. Yeah. He said that he couldn't get up from bed after a game. So it was just a struggle on Monday and, you know, get some treatment on Tuesday, blah, blah, blah. And he really didn't even practice. And he kind of played because, you know, he was a role player at yeah. like goal light situations and just short yardage. And 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 I remember LT Ladanian Thompson, not Lawrence Taylor, which yep. I love also, but Ladanian Thompson, one of my idols. Uh, he said also that uh, when his career, you know, moved on. He said, I learned how to take care of my body. And many of these athletes have resources, technology, you know, doctors, medicine. The et money. Cetera, et cetera, et cetera, the money, exactly, frankly, even now. Yes, that many of those great players from other sports, from many sports from many years ago, did not have them. So, I mean, it's kind of unfair to compare them. But if we don't compare them, then what are we going to talk about, right? So, yeah, yeah. Well, Tony, I love I love getting down this path, and we're going to do that again sometime soon. But before uh, we wrap up here, I want to get into uh, what I call the breaking news round. Okay, it's like do 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 breaking news, right? 
And so we talked a lot about your career. We talked a lot about different things as it relates to being a binational reporter. But I, these are just some fun questions that I've adapted from the Actors Studio, uh, James Lipton. And they're like 10 questions. You kind of first thing that comes to mind, help our folks get under the mind and in your mind a little bit on and what you enjoy. Uh, would you mind uh, indulging me in this? Let's do it. I'm up for it. All right, all right. All right, Tony. What is your favorite word? Uh, what, okay, that's a... Uh, wow, my favorite word. Okay. Uh, food. <laughs> food. The word food is your favorite word. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I love food. So. <laughs> okay. So what is your least favorite word then? Um, I guess... Sadness, hmm. probably. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess that that would be my least favorite. Okay. Because obviously it relates to something that's not, you know, good. So. Meh. Yeah. I guess sadness. What uh? What turns you on creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Hmm. Uh. Ooh, that's a oh geez, that's a good one. I mean, I'm trying to think of something real quick you know to to to, to not cut the the whole idea of the of the breaking news but god i you know probably a a good conversation you know a, a good conversation with pretty much anyone mm-hmm. if if it's if it's real good about anything james you know i mean I've I've met people from from many places and, and from many backgrounds, etc. And if you can have a good conversation with anyone, that could either inspire you at work, at at uh, your home, uh, to create new stuff. Uh, I think I've always been a fan of having good, com- I mean, conversations that end up being good. Yeah. Uh, from topics that you know sometimes it could be something that could have an impact on society or sports related or food or music yeah or just the way that people handle certain situations because you kind of get this you know uh retrospective and uh, I, I get your opinion you get mine and then i can learn mm-hmm. from you, you can learn from me etc I, I think a good conversation that that's that's good enough that's that's amazing for me got it what turns you off uh, you know, people being mean. Yeah. I, I, I guess that I mean, for sometimes, sometimes for some reason, uh, on any situation, if if you reach out to people or you you want to talk about something or literally just say, "Excuse me, I'm just coming through," and if people are mean for whatever reason, uh, I don't know, maybe they're having a bad day or anything, but but they don't have to be mean i mean come on we're, we're all in this together you know when, when yeah. i say this i mean the world society community etc so uh, probably you don't have to like give people a rose or anything or flower or whatever but but don't be mean you know just, just i got you i got you what's your favorite curse word tony oh <laughs> Uh, I guess I have two. I don't know if I can you have say two. It you can say them both. We, we we have the explicit tag on this podcast. If you'd like to share them, okay, I guess I guess shit is is number one. Shit. That's the first time we heard someone say shit yet. All right. That's number one. Uh, the number two is it's the one with the F. You know, I I don't feel comfortable. I have a report. I don't know. All right. So you're not going to. So that's interesting that the number two was actually number one in this situation but i get it okay so shit okay. and the f word okay i got you i got you tony what uh what sound or noise do you love um i guess the sound of a bat hitting a ball literally hmm. like baseball like the whole yeah that's just, i love it's a, be- it's a sweet sound man it's a sweet sound what noise do you hate Honking, honking. You know, you know, from the cars and all yeah. that. I just, I do not like that. And I, 
I guess one of those squeaking sounds also when you know people are on a blackboard and just you know with their nails. Yeah, <laughs> don't even talk about it. All right, I got you. Yeah. I, know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I don't want to hear. Yeah. That's the second one. Uh, okay, what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Um, it, for, I don't know why, but I kind of mm. always have a you know like a hunch there that I could be uh, successful or or at least knowledgeable in the marketing world okay um i I think i have a a good take on certain things i'm not sure though but but i've always i always thought that if i you know if i weren't in this you know uh, business i would probably be in the marketing business gotcha what profession would you not want to do Mm. Uh, okay um you know those people that go up the you know the like the very tall buildings and clean the the windows? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I uh, respect. I would not do that. I, geez, that is very dangerous. Yeah. Um, that, but, but I mean, I, gee, wow. I guess, I guess that's the one. Uh. Uh. uh no, that's good. That's good. I got. I, I'm with you on that one. The heights thing is kind of kind of weird uh, for me too so okay so I mean, t- i've been to tall buildings but but, but yeah to hang from the outside of one is a whole different story <laughs> oh no hell no, no. <laughs> all right tony so our final uh breaking news question if heaven exists what would you like to hear god say when you arrive at the pearly gates you did well in life um, I think that would that would be very meaningful. I don't, geez, wow, that's a that's a great question, James. Um, because I always I hope I I have and I hope I keep on doing it. But you know, do good to people in in a certain way. You know, sometimes what is good for one person is not good enough for another one. I don't know if that makes any sense, but but I I really hope that when I'm done. Um, I, I kind of helped people or, or did some good in their life, you know, either because, uh, uh, I don't know, someone needs to ride it back home and I helped them that day. And, and not to say, wow, I'm, I'm everything. I can do anything and I'm, I'm going to help everyone. And, and yeah, come to me. Not, not from that perspective. You know, like just to say, you know, that I was a genuine good human being. Mm-hmm. I know I've made mistakes. We've all made mistakes at some point for some reason at a certain time. Uh, but uh, I guess that that'll be very cool to hear from God. Tony, you know, thank you very much for that answer, and thank you for playing the breaking news round. You know, but like you would ask uh, one of my clients, you know, at the end of an interview, I got to ask you, you know, is there anything else you'd like to share with our Flack Talk listeners before we close the show? Uh, well, you know what? This is going to sound probably a little cliche, but it's it's true. Just follow your dreams, man. I mean, you're, you're talking to a guy that uh, you know, grew up here in Tijuana, wanting to work somehow in San Diego in the media, either either you know reporting news or doing play by play for one of his favorite teams, and you know writing for either a newspaper, or a magazine, and and all that. And at different stages of my life, I've been able to do that. And and it's just because of hard work you know a lot of people have helped me out and i'm very thankful for that but you need to follow your dreams i mean you you don't get to that point of either a door opening or someone you know you know lending you a hand or or something unless you just keep on keeping on so um i guess that's my advice just 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 read as much as you can know what you're doing and sometimes you just got to wait for a certain opportunity to present itself, to you know, jump on it and, and just go from there. And many doors will eventually open just, you know, like they say, you know, stay in school, uh, but, you know, <laughs> like stay in school and, and really just, just never give up and people will reach out and then eventually you can pay it forward. You can, you can, you can also eventually, you know, reach out to other people to to help them like many others have yeah. helped you in this case 
me. So just 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 don't give up on your dreams. And and again, you're probably gonna end up doing certain stuff that you never imagined you'd do, and you're gonna love it. So so just just do it, do it. That's great advice, Tony. That's great advice, especially for our young journalists and PR folks who listen to this show. Tony, this has been wonderful. I really appreciate you coming on Flack Talk. Thank you for being a guest. No, it's amazing, James. Thank you very much for for inviting me. It was a pleasure. It was fun. And hey, listen to Flack Talk. It's pretty cool. If you liked Flack Talk and want to learn more about your favorite muckrakers and newsbreakers, please hit the subscribe button or visit flacktalk.com. New Flack Talk episodes with James Canning air every other week, wherever you get your podcasts.